Hey everyone, good afternoon. Let me know if you can hear me. Oh, hello. See so y'all, thank you for joining me again for another three day stretch. We'll start here in just a few minutes. I'm having my cold brew coffee again today, so I'm hoping I can keep my excitement under wraps here a little bit with all the caffeine I'm drinking. But we shall see. It's happy almost Friday. It's got a little jacket on, keeps me warm for my cold brew. Now the question is, what would you give if you had someone who consumed too much caffeine, was having too much stimulant effects, and maybe even a seizure? What could you do then? Got it. Although I would recommend being a little more definitive in your answers. Uh, on rotations, if a preceptor asks you something, you go, Benzo? Does not sound nearly as confident as Benzo. And then you can be confidently incorrect. Uh... That's okay. This is a, a safe space to be not, not confident right now. That was a good question. Have you tried not doing so much cocaine? There you go. Yes, lorazepam. That'd be a good one to start with. That's my, my benzo of choice for people who um, are having kind of too much stimulant effects. You'll find too, it's a lot cleaner um, in terms of its actions than something like um, like Howdall or something. We'll, we'll get into that in the behavioral section later on, but um, I, I certainly prefer that in a lot of cases. Um, a, lot, a lot of kind of nasty side effects and stuff with from antipsychotics. Yes, you're positively exuding confidence. Great. I'm going to start here in just a minute or two. So, if you have questions, feel free to post them up. You Well, I take some offense to that, Kelly. I find that the Lord of the Rings Extended Edition is the definitive way to watch that movie so um you can you can just get right on out of this class i'm just kidding to you um very good i remember um for both of my children when they were born I had a lot of time late at night rocking them to sleep and uh, i believe i watched the entire uh series both times with those children and harry potter too which uh, at least with phoebe uh, my youngest one i watched the whole harry potter movie series a lot of free time on your hands when you're on paternity leave, as it turns out. Those little infants, they don't do a whole lot. They sleep and cry. Turn of the King is pretty good. Uh, it's definitely worth a watch. It's interesting to see, you know, just the, especially when you watch them in, in succession, the how the kids age up uh, through the whole thing and how kind of the tone of it gets much more... Uh, much more adult as time goes on. Yeah, not a fan of the Hobbit trilogy either. That was a little, a little bonkers. Although I remember watching the the original cartoons of Lord of the Rings and the Hobbit back in the day, and that was, that was some really trippy '70s era kind of animations. Pretty wild. I heard of using Tapirame for sleepwalking. Um, I have not seen that necessarily used, but that's an interesting uh, thing. I'll have to check that out. I've seen other like random drugs used for things like um, uh, hiccups. For instance, you can use an antipsychotic called Thorazine for hiccups. So there's, um, you know, uh, you'll find kind of like one off uh, treatments for some of these kind of oddball conditions, some medications. Oh, well, I'm glad someone likes the dad jokes. I will tend to keep them up. Um, I'm a dad, so that's kind of the only jokes that I'm allowed to tell uh, by by law. <laughs> 
that's kind of what it is. Uh, let's start recording though. Uh, the amount of likes. You, oh yeah, I really appreciate that. Someone had a like on this even before I started, which I said, well, that's that's great confidence. I hope you actually <laughs> I can deliver on that. Um, so anyway, so we were discussing, um, you know, the majority of our actually all of the drugs we're going to use uh, at, in terms of anti-epileptics. Um, we talked about some of them being better for sort of like long-term maintenance and prevent prevention of seizures. We talked about uh, things that are good for like acute treatment, which may not be great for like long-term maintenance because of like side effects like sedation and whatnot. So for instance, like you don't see benzos use first line for um, routine maintenance therapy because of their sedative sort of effects, but um, you may see them as like an add-on potentially. So like a clonazepam, you may see added on, you know, as a second or third agent potentially. And again, a lot is very patient dependent, very provider dependent. You'll find certain neurologists will just have certain, um, you know, drugs that they tend to like for one reason or another, whether it be evidence-based or anecdotal, just really depends. Now, um, we mentioned treatment for status epileptic is how you kind of have, um, you know, you always go benzos first. You always try two or three doses of that first to see if that's going to break the seizure. Uh, if not, that's when you kind of start to work down your um, different various medications. Phenytoin, Capra tend to be sort of the most common ones I see people go with. Uh, and then you can kind of try just random stuff until something works or you have to put the patient basically into a coma uh, with something like pentobarb or uh, propofol or something like that. Don't worry about propofol. We'll talk about that uh, at a later time. Anyway, um, when we're stopping uh, anti-epileptic drug therapy, typically what we're going to see is that we'll have patients, um, hopefully they've been free and well-controlled of seizures uh, for two to five years or so. Um, typically, this is going to be for someone who has like a normal neurologic exam. So they don't have like any structural issues that uh, kind of predisposes them to seizures in the first place. Um, you know, they should have a normal EEG and all of that. And then um, when you're withdrawing these medications, it's important to do it slowly, especially with medications um, that directly influence GABA, like your benzos and your barbiturates, because you can have a, uh, a chance to have a withdrawal seizure, which obviously you don't want to cause because then you got to go right back and treat it with the medications that you were, uh, you know, withdrawing from the patient. So, you know, slow and low see what the patient tolerates, see how their seizures are developing, and then when you're coming off of it, again, slowly withdrawing these medications to try to prevent any sort of rebound effects is going to be important for them. So um, one of the things I want to mention here too is uh, when you're doing therapy to drug monitoring for these patients, it's important to understand uh, if you're doing levels, if you're getting a level, like why are you doing it in the first place, right? Um, again, efficacy can be difficult to determine because it's hard to say, would the patient have had a seizure without the medication or is the medication actually doing its job, right? That's one reason why you may want to get it potentially just to see if they're within the therapeutic range. If they come back and their level's been low this whole time, then it may indicate the drug really wasn't doing anything and the patient would have been seizure-free regardless. Um, you can do this if you suspect they're having adverse drug reactions or if they're um, you know, having uh, any particular side effects which seem to be uh, related to the drug. Check a level, see if it's high. That may give you a clue as to what's going on. Just make sure that a patient is at steady state by the time you get the level. Remember, if you get it too early, it's going to be appear to be falsely low. And recall, you have to wait about four to five half-lives before you really get to a steady state. Um, so if you get it too early, you're going to think it's too low, which is a false sort of assumption, and then you're going to try to increase the dose potentially. And so that may lead to, once it gets to the new steady state, it'll be too high, right? So again, check the half-lives, see if you're going to be at a steady state level. Remember, though, if you give a bolus dose... If you give a loading dose, you will bypass that. You should already be at steady state at that point once you go to the normal maintenance dosing. Other reasons why we might do this would be due to potential drug interactions that we could be having, uh, for instance, between something like um, if we introduce someone on carbamazepine and, for instance, I'm trying to think of another good example, um, something like um, maybe they're on rifampin, right? Uh, rifampin is a uh, CYP3 or 4 inducer, which could induce the metabolism of something like carbamazepine, right? That'd be something you may want to check a level on just to see what the new new steady state is. Uh, and again, always treat the patient, not the level. I know something we say a lot, um, but you'll find um, times when you want to look at those labs and use those as the definitive thing of uh, d the deciding factor on what you're going to do for the patient, whether change the drug dose, change the drug altogether. But again, you know, they can have a little bit of a high level and they could be having no side effects and no seizures, and you don't have to do anything. You just leave the leave it alone. So if it's not broke, 
don't try to fix it, right? Just because the level might be a little off. That could be normal for them. Or when you see a, uh, you know, a therapeutic range for a drug that's for the majority of people, it may not be appropriate for all people, right? So let's look at some of the, you kind of just uh, sort of uh, coalescing all of the, the kind of side effects we were talking about. Um, in general, when you're managing these patients, CNS effects are going to be the, the top ones, right? Which makes sense because of the fact that we are directly affecting the CNS to try to inhibit these really hyperexcitable neurons, right? Now, again, this can range. Um, most commonly, you're going to see drowsiness, but this can go all the way up to drug-induced seizures in some cases. So you got to be really cautious um, from that standpoint, um, especially if the levels are starting to ride up really high. Uh, you know, if you have a potential overdose, either due to intentional um, misuse or uh, accidental misuse. I've seen in some cases, this is actually a good example, um, where a patient, with, a PEDS patient was on phenytoin. It comes as an oral suspension. Um, but remember, a suspension... Those particles don't stay suspended forever. They tend to settle out at the bottom just due to gravity. Uh, and so you have to shake up those bottles before you um, uh, give the medication to make sure that it's in, in a homogenous solution, right? So the concentration is the same throughout. What uh, I've seen at least once or twice happen is where um, the parent does not realize that. They just go ahead and give the medication um, without shaking it up. And so they realize that, you know, towards the beginning of the month, Patients having all these breakthrough seizures, it does not appear the phenytoin is working very well. And then towards the end of the month, all of a sudden the patient is completely lethargic. They're totally snowed, right? And you're like, well, what the heck is going on here? Why would they have such, you know, uh, minimal effects at the beginning of the month and then have all these really heavy effects towards the end of the month? A lot of it has to do with the fact that they weren't shaking it up. And so all the drugs settled out towards the bottom, right? So getting very little drug at the top and a whole lot of drug at the bottom. The little things like that where you can see that the, the side effects can range. Again, that might be another case where you want to get a level to see what's going on, things like that. Now, typically these patients um, with that sedation I mentioned, a lot of this um, can be concerning, you know, from a quality of life standpoint. You know, if they need to go to work or something, but they're falling asleep. Uh, but also look at things like, um, you know, their dizziness, right? They could be a fall risk, especially with, uh, you know, ataxia and, and the dizziness to go along with that. Um, so that is something you want to be concerned about. Uh, in general, lamictal, lamotrigine, and valproic acid tend to be relatively less drowsy-inducing than the other agents there. So for a lot of adult patients, I see uh, for new onset seizures, they'll actually start with uh, lamictal first because it tends to have a relatively good side effect profile for that patient population. Um, phenobarb, not rec uh, recommended routinely unless you're dealing with neonates. That's really where that's the drug of choice for those uh, kiddos there. Or if it's like an add-on as like a you know third or fourth medication potentially. Um, as I mentioned, uh, with, with Capra, you do have to worry about some of those like mood changes and things like that. Um, and in the studies, they actually found 13.3% exhibited things like psychosis and suicide attempts. I've clinically, I don't see that, uh, nearly as much. I, I find that this is very well tolerated. However, it is a good education point just to say, Hey, you know, just monitor for any mood changes. It could be related back to the Capra there. And of course, other AEDs that we've looked at, you know, can worsen other, um, you know, other conditions like depression, anxiety, potentially, um, especially if you're dealing with an older patient who may have dementia or something, those can be worsened. It may seem like the patient's dementia is getting worse, but it could be the medications we're putting on top of that. I think someone had a question over here. Sticky board. Uh, someone said, if a patient has been on dual AED therapy with lamotrigine and zanisamide for 20 years and only had a few failed withdrawal attempts as a child, would you recommend trying medication withdrawal again now that the patient's older or just continue taking medication? Is it safe to stay on dual therapy for life? Well, that sounds extremely specific, so I wonder if you're talking about anyone in particular. But um, as always, you know, I'm not giving you guys medical advice, so I would say, uh, first of all, that I would, you know, lie with the decision of the, the provider and the patient, you know, working collaboratively. However, um, there's nothing wrong necessarily being on dual therapy the rest of that person's life, right? You know, it could be um, that that's just what's required. Um, in the case here where it's an idea of, okay, well, they failed years ago, it doesn't necessarily mean they're going to fail now, right? Especially if it's gone from a time when they were a child to now where they're a mature adult. So it's reasonable that you could consider, um, you know, withdrawing one of those medications to see how they tolerate it. Uh, and then, you know, go with the single therapy and if they can still tolerate that, then withdraw that and see how it goes. Very much um, patient specific in that sort of case there. Someone said for daily use, you may want to put an adult on lamictal for seizures, but in an acute setting, give them a benzo. 
Um, yeah, so if I had someone who was coming in, so say someone, um, like two, two situations, let's say like you deal with like the emergent situation. So if someone, um, has a seizure at home, they get, uh, transported by AMS to the ER and you're the PA on, on, uh, you know, working that, that shift. Um, if they have an acute seizure right there, yeah, benzos are your best friend. That's going to be what you're going to go with nine times out of 10, probably, probably 95 times out of a hundred. Um, however, say it was a situation where the patient had a seizure at home, get transported to the ER, they get checked out, they're there for a couple of hours, no further seizures, and they say, okay, follow with neurology. At that point, you can then have them follow up. You may give them a script for like a PRN benzo potentially, um, but then they follow up with the neurologist and they say, okay, well, let's go ahead and start you on something, you know, and or they may consider waiting to see if you have another seizure or they decide to start. That would be the case where Lamictal might be a good good thing to start. Um, so as I mentioned, unless you have something that you're going to give, give a loading dose of to try to get them to stay state right away, um, a lot of these other meds are going to be more for kind of starting on outpatient basis or, um, you know, giving them time to kind of build up their levels and, and kick in. So Lamictal is not one that I typically see we will bolus the patient with and, and just initiate therapy like in an emergent setting. Um, however, things like phenytoin, uh, Keppra, uh, valproic acid, those are probably the three more common ones that I've seen with phenytoin and Keppra being the most common out of those two, right? But again, first line is always going to be benzos for acute active seizures. Good questions. I'm glad you guys are staying nice and engaged. I really like that. Um, anyway, so the dermatologic reactions, I mentioned um, this is a big one, especially with... Um, uh, Lamotrigine, this is the one I always want you to think about, at least with that drug, if nothing else. And there's actually a black box warning on that, that they have any sign of rash, you want to immediately discontinue, right? And you're like, well, why would I give this to my adult patient? You just, you just said it's the preferred drug. Again, this is not going to happen to everyone, right? So it's a low risk, but it is a risk we know about. And so, um, again, you're weighing the benefits versus those risks there. Um, other drugs that have that potential to cause Stevens-Johnson's, which can then progress into toxic epidermal necrolysis, or TEN, um, can include things like ethosuximide, carbamazepine, phenytoin. A lot of these have those risks, so you just want to at least educate the patients. Say, hey, if you notice, like, you know, you get all these, like, this blister all of a sudden, or if you notice you're getting a sore in your mouth, or if, you know, you start to notice your skin is getting really inflamed and, and you develop this rash, those are the things you want to be really educating the patient on that, hey, you need to probably stop the medication and come into the ER. Um, but the worst ones are going to be lamotrigine and then oxcarbazepine. I, I don't see this as often. I've seen a few cases of, of Stevens Johnson certainly coming in um, for someone on lamotrigine, but um, I've not seen quite as often with oxcarbazepine. However, I did have one case where um, I had a patient who was being admitted. Uh, they were on multiple medications. And I'm um, sorry, I was getting a spam call, so let's check on my phone. Um, I was, uh, had a patient being admitted from the ER. I was actually working up in the central pharmacy and they were being admitted for Stevens Johnson. So I was like, oh, wow, that's pretty, you know, you don't see that every single day. So I wanted to check it out and I was doing the admin orders for them. And so, um, I saw that they went ahead and the patient at home, I think they were on, uh, Lamotrigine and they were also on, um, what else was the other one? Might have been, I don't, I don't think they're on phenytoin, but it was probably, I think it was actually valproic acid, which actually has a little bit of a risk too. Um, and so the patient's coming in and they went ahead and the neurologist discontinued the lamotrigine, which made total sense because if I saw Stevens Johnson's, I'm on Lamictal, that looks like the smoking gun, right? And so then, um, you know, I was looking through the rest of the medication orders and I was like, well, you know, it's hard to tell with the patient on multiple AEDs, like which one was it? Was it Lomotrogene, which seems obvious, but it could be something else, right? So I went ahead and did a search and was looking through and I found that, hey, actually, you know, it looks like the VPA they have could also be playing a role here as well. So at that point, I called the neurologist and I had a conversation with him. I was like, hey, you know, just so you know, this could also be playing a role here too. Do you want to continue it? Do you want to discontinue it? At that point, they decided to go ahead and just discontinue everything and or discontinue all their AEDs and say, okay, you know, let's go ahead and just hold off on all these and make sure we get the patient through the Stevens Johnson's first and then figure it out. So then you're like, well, what do you do for the patient seizures? Like, well, you know, the patient's admitted, getting taken care of from this you know, dermatologic reaction. Um, how do you prevent them from having more seizures? Well, that's where you have as needed orders for benzo. So you'll see that a lot in patient where they'll have, you know, lorazepam, you know, 0.05 makes per kilo, um, you know, QPR or Q, you know, two hour PRN seizures, right? Um, that would be a common order you might see on there for someone for prevention of, or actually for acute treatment of seizures. So that way if the nurse notices patient seizing, they can go in, give them a dose, and that way hopefully can cause cessation of that, right? 
So that's just a, a real life example how you might actually try to manage someone who's coming in on multiple meds, which could be causing this reaction, right? Uh, from a hematologic standpoint, you can run into some issues occasionally, especially with like valproic acid, carbamazepine, phenytoin. The worst offender here is definitely going to be felbamate. Uh, if you recall that one, we don't really like to use too often due to the fact that uh, it can cause aplastic anemia, but you can also see some other subtle changes like leukopenia, agranulocytosis, things like that, um, that you would want to monitor the CBC for, right? Get a baseline, get a follow-up, especially if they start to complain about anything like um, sore throat, you know, fever, unusual bleeding or bruising, all of those things you would normally think about as being, as, you know, a, a sign that something is going on here, so you can check that CBC out. Um, so that would be something to watch for. In terms of the hepatologic reactions here, um, some of the more ones that are hard on the liver tend to be things like phenytoin, carbamazepine, and valproic acid. Um, definitely valproic acid, you got to monitor the LFTs. Um, all of these you would do so, but definitely with valproic acid, this is when I'm more likely to see some reactions here. Um, and again, you know, you'd be monitoring a baseline follow-up. You continue to monitor this, you know, as they're on it um, for, you know, several months or so. Um, and then especially if you're going to be on multiple medications, because you could see someone on carbamazepine and VPA, for instance, and both of those could be kind of synergistically causing issues with the liver. And normally, like I mentioned, if the LFT start to climb above like three times the upper limit of normal, that's when we start to consider um, discontinuing or maybe adjusting our doses or something. So uh, in terms of monitoring, again, we mentioned seizure control. So how often are they having seizures? Again, they may be down to like two seizures a day, and that could be really good for them compared to what they're normally at. Um, looking for adverse drug reactions, look for drug levels if applicable. Um, again, not every drug we mentioned there has levels available, but some of them do. Um, and then, you know, looking at their labs that are specific for individual drugs, right? So if you recall sodium, which drugs would I want to monitor sodium for, right? So probably oxcarbazepine number one, and then uh, a close second would be carbamazepine because they can cause a SIDH, right? things like that. So those are kind of things I would want you to consider, um, you know, especially if you had like a test question and said, hey, which of these labs would you want to get for a patient starting this medication, right? Um, so little things like that you can consider um, as being, you know, kind of testable questions, for instance. So as I mentioned, um, in terms of therapy to drug monitoring, useful for things like carbamazepine, phenobar, valproic acid, phenytoin, those are probably the more common ones we're going to get. I've had cases where, um, you know, providers want to order like lamotrigine levels or levoteracetam levels. And I'm just like, well, we don't have a therapeutic range, so you could do the level and you could know the patient's taking it or not. It's lovely to be positive or, or negative. Um, but you get a level and it's kind of like, well, what do I do with this? Do I, you know, if their level comes back at a whatever it is, and they're still having seizures, well, you would still do something with that. You still want to go ahead and up their dose, for instance. Um, so it's difficult when you don't have that useful correlation. Um, and so, and that can be expensive too, right? Because oftentimes you can get a phenytoin level in the hospital, no problem, right? You can go to Quest um, Labs and get a, a phenytoin level. Um, if you need a Keppra level, that's something you might have to send off to like the Mayo Clinic, for instance, and that's going to be a big turnaround time. It could be several days, uh, and it could be, you know, pretty expensive to do so. So again, you always got to think about the cost that goes along with these things. You can order any lab you want in the entire world, but it doesn't mean that it's going to be necessarily all that um, feasible in terms of just the logistics of things. Okay, so we're talking about the SIP system here. Again, anti-epileptic drugs can be inhibitors. If you find some of them can be inducers, you would want to know those, especially for testing purposes and about potential interactions here. Um, so, of course, anytime you're prescribing, especially, you know, if you're, like, say, working in the ER, for instance, uh, I know I will go back to the example of working in the ER. That's just what my natural mind goes to because that's what my experience is. But, um, you know, if you, you're consulting with a neurologist and they say, hey, go ahead and start them on this drug, you know, it's still you prescribing that drug, it's still your responsibility to do that due diligence and just go through their medication record and see, hey, is there anything here that's going to cause a problem if I introduce this drug? Because maybe that neurologist didn't think about it. Maybe they weren't even aware that patient was on that drug. Um, so especially if you're doing consultants on the phone where they don't have access to all the information you have, that's why you got to do that. Okay, so oral contraceptives. So this is an interesting one. We'll talk more about OCPs when we get into um, the ob section later on. I have, boy, I tell you what, we talk a lot about uh, the menstrual cycle and, and estrogen and progesterone is definitely nothing I ever thought I would be uh, quite so knowledgeable about, but it is something that, you know, sometimes you find yourselves in certain lots in life. But when I say OCPs, oral contraceptives, I'm primarily referring to things that are estrogen and progesterone based. Again, the goal of those drugs, which we'll talk much about, more about later, is to have 
high enough levels of those two compounds to suppress ovulation to prevent pregnancy from occurring, right? They're useful for other things, but that's you know typically what we think about as a contraceptive product. So remember, if you have drugs that are inducing those enzymes that metabolize things like estrogen, like phenytoin, phenobarb, carbamazepine, what you can find is that they will induce those enzymes, they will metabolize estrogen more quickly, and then they will then drop levels of the estrogen, okay? So estrogen levels are now down lower than where they should be, and what that means is that the chance for ovulation occurs, right? So it happen. Well, you know, the patient can get pregnant, right? And that may not be great, especially if they're on something like valproic acid, along with something like carbamazepine, which can lead to those neural tube defects like we mentioned, right? So this is why you're going to be really careful. Um, there's ways to get around this, right? So we'll talk about um, intrauterine devices. We'll talk about other means of um, trying to avoid those kind of interactions. But this is something I want you to think about specifically with um, the, the anti-epileptic drugs. Plenty of them have no interactions with oral contraceptives, so like VPA, levotracetam, things like that are all reasonable to, to use for those patients there. And just as an example, another one you could use would be like a medroxyprogesterone or a depo shot. That is just a progesterone only product that would not interact with um, any of the other ones. It's really the estrogen that has the interacting problems. Okay, so any questions on that section? That seemed like a lot. It was probably, that's okay. All right, so moving on. Next, I want to talk about questions. Nope. Let's talk about Parkinson's disease. So this will be important when we get into talking about antipsychotics as well. Um, so what is uh, Parkinson's disease? Well, basically, it's a loss of these dopaminergic neurons, right? So dopamine is really important for a lot of different things in, in our brains. Um, one of the big ones is going to be movement, right? Dopamine helps to cause movement to occur um, through various uh, you know, different pathways we're going to see here in a little bit, including things like the substantia nigra. If we have a, a deficiency of that dopamine, what we're going to see is this hypokinesia, bradykinesia. We're going to have rigidity. They're going to have a difficult time initiating movements because they're lacking this dopamine. I'll show you some picture here in just a little bit. Um, there's a lot of reasons why this might occur. Um, some of this is just due to age in a lot of cases there for the idiopathic causes, um, but certainly you can even find drug-induced causes for this. So we'll find that not only losing those dopaminergic neurons can cause Parkinson's, but actually drugs can induce a Parkinson-like state if they block the activity of dopamine. So we talked about that briefly with metoclopramide, which is a, normally used as either a prokinetic or a, um, antiemetic but it can also block dopamine receptors, which helps with the nausea vomiting, but can also in very high doses cause this Parkinson-like sort of side effect, right? You see how this sort of all kind of comes back and, and loops around on itself a little bit. Um, interestingly enough, some chemicals can do this too. There was a really interesting case. You can look this up, but there's a, um, uh, I don't know if this is a case study. They wrote a whole book about it, but it was about um, uh, the junkie, uh, what's it called? The junkie that froze himself or the frozen junkie, something like that. Um, you know, like the term junkie necessarily, but that was what they had termed it. Um, it was really kind of interesting. This was back in the day, uh, I think it might have been in the 80s perhaps, but um, it was uh, a time where people were trying to engineer their own like synthetic drugs or synthetic versions of other things like heroin, for instance. And so this one person who was a, a enterprising uh, chemist who worked, uh, let's say, uh, out of his own home, perhaps, um, decided to try and, and make one of these. And so he made a product called MPTP and so decided to, as any, um, you know, uh, you know, adventurous scientist, decided to test on themselves to see how it worked. Um, and he went ahead and what happened was is that that chemical itself actually fried all of the dopaminergic neurons in his brain. And so he was able to induce... Parkinson's in himself, which unfortunately for him was a permanent side effect. They basically found him catatonic because he could not initiate any movements. It was so profound. But what the sort of interesting beneficial side effect of that was is that, yeah, very unfortunate. Uh, again, don't do drugs, especially if you made them yourselves. Um, just not, not a good idea. But uh, interestingly enough, the, the uh, beneficial side effect of that was the fact that now researchers had a means to induce Parkinson's-like states in um, animals, which means that we can now do testing for new medications and, and things like that, which, you know, animal testing is always a, a touchy subject for sure. But um, being able to induce a, um, you know, a model for a disease state helps out with that research and being able to um, you know, basically replicate it so that way we can find out, okay, what's going to work for this, what's not. So pretty wild stuff. Um, but anyway, so ultimately, though, <clears throat> always goes back to lack of dopamine, right? So anyway, so what's happening here is that we're going to find 
that um, here we have the thalamus, we have the substantia nigra, which is going to be responsible for sending out a lot of this dopamine signals here. Um, and of course, we're going to find dopamine is also important for other pathways as well. You'll find it, especially with like dopamine, this green pathway for the mesolimbic um, pathway is really important for that reward center. So um, when talking about like addiction and things like that, this is a really important pathway for that reward system. Um, however, we're going to be looking at this nigrostriatal pathway as being really important, uh, important for movement. Now, there's two main types of uh, dopamine receptors. There's D1, which is uh, stimulatory, and D2, which is inhibitory, okay? That'll become important here in a moment. Now, this gets a little bit confusing, but I'm going to kind of give you the, the easy takeaway, okay? Basically, what happens is that you have D1, which we mentioned is stimulatory. So all the red signals are stimulatory, and then all of the um, black uh, lines here are going to be inhibitory, and in, or black dots are inhibitory. So, and again, if you go back to this, it'll make sense. So what you find is there's a delicate balance here between these different pathways, where ultimately we're trying to send signals down to the thalamus, which is going to coordinate those uh, motor uh, movements, and then sends that signal to the motor cortex to actually enact them. Okay. Notice here, there's a lot of different um, signals being sent here, right? Remember, GABA, ergic um, signals are going to be inhibitory in nature. So by stimulating D1, that's going to cause more GABA to be released, which actually inhibits this globus pallidus uh, and substantia nigra here, versus, if you notice here, there's a pathway where we're actually having um, glutamate being released, which will cause a stimulatory signal here that will then affect this GABAergic neuron to, if it's being stimulated, it'll inhibit this. If it's being, um, uh, if you have a GABA acting on a GABA, you're gonna see it actually will inhibit that firing there. Again, it gets a little complicated in terms of sort of the interconnections here and sort of being stimulatory versus inhibitory. But ultimately, when things are working normally, you get a good signal from the thalamus to the motor cortex because there's a balance here between the D1 and the D2 signals and all this other stuff going on, okay? Don't get lost in the weeds on this. Just know that by having a good balance here, you're going to get a good signal from the thalamus to the motor cortex, and you can initiate movements normally. Okay, what happens when you have issues of uh, with someone like Parkinson's? Right. Ultimately, what you find is that there's going to be a lack of dopamine coming from the substantia nigra. Um, I can't remember all the the specific um, names for those, but anyway, so you're l lacking signal here, and so ultimately, what you're going to find is that you're losing a lot of those stimulatory signals. And overall, what you're going to get is too much of an inhibitory signal on the thalamus. There's too much GABA being released here onto the thalamus, which means that this signal is inhibited. So you may want to initiate a movement, but you can't initiate it because that signal from the thalamus never makes it to the motor cortex, or it's more difficult to initiate that movement, which is why they had the bradykinesia, why they have um, uh, the rigidity associated with um, Parkinson's, right? So ultimately, that's what we're seeing. So here's the normal where you have a nice balance here where you can get a good signal going to the motor cortex. In Parkinson's, you lack that dopamine and thus no signal or very little signals going from the thalamus to the motor cortex, okay? If that's all you know, then you got a good handle on it so far, right? So what's also interesting too is that there is a sort of seesaw effect between um, the activity of dopamine and acetylcholine. What ends up happening in Parkinson's, though, is that as you lose dopamine activity, which causes that rigidity and hypokinesia, you have overactivity of acetylcholine. And if you recall, acetylcholine can act on nicotinic receptors, and that can actually cause that tremor. So it's weird because you think, okay, well, they, um, they have a hard time moving or initiating movement, but they have this resting tremor which seems like a lot of movement. All it has to do is that overactivity of acetylcholine there in the brain. So um, less dopamine activity, more acetylcholine, that's what's causing the tremor in those patients. So here, uh, let's imagine we have a dopaminergic neuron. Dopaminergic is a fun word to say, I'll, I'll tell you that. Um, so let's walk through the different pathways here in terms of how we actually make dopamine. Dopamine is gonna be abbreviated DA, as you'll see in the bottom here, you can read all of those. Um, again, don't get too lost in the names. I'll tell you just the important ones I want you to know, okay? So let's say we have, uh, we wanna produce dopamine. Well, dopamine is mainly gonna be produced in these neurons here where you see things like precursors like phenylalanine or L-dopa, levodopa is another name for that, can come in and eventually you're gonna get uh, it converted over into dopamine, okay? Just know levodopa is gonna be a precursor to dopamine, okay? So a couple of ways that we can break down that dopamine. There's going to be two main enzymes we're going to talk about. There's one called COM-T, which is catecholamine O-methyltransferase. And when I say catecholamine, that's going to be sort of a, um, a wide-ranging uh, group of neurotransmitters that includes things like dopamine, um, 
norepinephrine, epinephrine, serotonin, they all kind of fit into that catecholamine uh, sort of family there, okay? Anyway, uh, actually serotonin is not so much, but it's more the epi, norepi, and, and dopamine. Those are the main catecholamines I think of. Anyway, um, COMT, which is catecholamine O-methyltransferase, is a means of degrading that L-DOPA down into an inactive compound. Okay, so that's one enzyme we're going to look at. There's also another one called monoamine oxidase B. Now, monoamine oxidase, if you talk about this in your behavioral health uh, class or when we get into the behavioral section later, monoamine oxidase is a, uh, another enzyme responsible for metabolizing catecholamines like uh, dopamine, norepinephrine, and epinephrine. Okay. This is actually going to be a big way we're going to see, and serotonin as well is going to be affected by this, but we're going to find that um, monoamine oxidase B specifically is responsible for metabolizing dopamine directly into an inactive compound, okay? So these two enzymes are going to be important. We'll talk about drug targets for that later. Uh, otherwise, whatever dopamine makes it through is able then to be packaged up in these vesicles. They can then be released in order to cause movement to occur, right? We'll have some dopamine transporters and things like that, but those aren't really going to be so important for our purposes here, okay? So just know, phenylalanine, other proteins are going to get absorbed into these neurons, which will be converted over into dopamine. L-DOPA is going to be a precursor for that. And there are two really important enzymes for metabolizing dopamine is COMT and monoamine oxidase B, okay? Hopefully you're still with me. If not, that's okay, let me know, and I will catch us up. So how do these patients present? Well, again, it's a lot of that difficulty in initiating movement. So the hypo and bradykinesia, that resting tremor. Um, if anyone's ever watched the movie called Awakenings, uh, it's a movie I think from the 80s or maybe early 90s with uh, Robin Williams and Robert De Niro. It was really, really uh, a cool movie to see um, kind of the, init the initial use of levodopa as a treatment for Parkinson's. And they had these patients that were on this ward in a, a, a like in an institute uh, where basically they're all catatonic. They couldn't get up and move around at all, basically because their Parkinson's was so um, uh, so so severe. And so they ended up giving L-dopa to these patients, and all of a sudden they could like get up and walk around and talk again. And it was pretty uh, interesting to see that happen. It was really kind of an awesome thing for the quality of life. However, we're going to see that it's going to be a temporary fix in in some cases there. Okay. Anyway, I'm glad uh, at least one person has seen it. They can back me up and saying it's a good movie. But um, anyway, so some other things you're going to find that will develop things like hypophonia. So maybe they have a hard time being able to, um, you know, make their voice heard. Uh, micrography is kind of interesting. They write really small, you know, things like that that can occur here. Um, certainly, they're going to have a lot of autonomic symptoms that can develop here as well. So um, things like, you know, uh, incontinence, uh, diaphoresis, you know, things like that are related to autonomic dysfunction. Because remember, they're having too much acetylcholine activity, right? which makes sense that you would have cholinergic side effects like incontinence, uh, diaphoresis, um, things like that. Constipation doesn't necessarily go with that so much, but it's another thing you, you can see potentially. And certainly mental status changes that can happen here. Um, yeah, certainly a lot of depression, dementia, all of that's kind of uh, grouped up with this. And so those are kind of the common things you're, you're going to be seeing with these patients here, which I don't want to get too much into the, um, yeah, the presentation. You'll get that elsewhere, probably in your neuro um, CMS block. Anyway, but how do we diagnose it? Well, a lot of times it's just based off presentation, based off history and whatnot. There's not like a lot of really good lab testing in order to determine if someone has Parkinson's. But one way we can actually um, test to see if they have it is by them presenting with these symptoms and then we can give them a supplement that will increase dopamine activity. And that can actually, if their symptoms improve, then that kind of gives you a pretty good idea that, yeah, that's what we're dealing with. So as an example, you can give them levodopa or another product called apomorphine we'll talk about later that if you give it to them, their symptoms resolve or they get better, then you know, okay, this person's lacking dopamine. They probably have Parkinson's, okay? Um, and again, this is a progressive disorder. Um, you're going to find that even though we have means of trying to slow it down or trying to uh, treat the symptoms, ultimately, um, this is not something we can ever really truly fix, unfortunately. So our goals here, try to minimize and try to reverse any kind of functional, functional disability they have there and hopefully try to prevent kind of long-term complications. Uh, Matt was saying when I was in nuke med, we had a scan called the DAT scan that helped diagnose it. Cool. That's interesting. Um, and again, uh, fortunate, uh, unfortunately, I don't really get into a lot of that uh, side of things there, but that's cool. There's uh, newer ways that we can, we can do that. Um, but certainly just like we have we means of um, using drugs to diagnose asthma, we can do the same thing with, with uh, Parkinson's there. Anyway, 
So uh, in terms of non-pharmacologic therapy, we can see that there are a lot of uh, education and support for these patients here, getting them signed up with certain services to help them out is important. Um, you know, things like deep brain stimulation can be really helpful. I actually saw a cool um, a video on Reddit just the other day where a guy just had a, a deep brain stimulator installed and he was finally able to eat um, cereal for the first time in like years. Because, you know, if you think about eating cereal, it's like a really easy task for you um, if you don't have Parkinson's. But if you have a really difficult time initiating movement and then you have that resting tremor, it can be difficult to keep anything in a spoon long enough to get it into your mouth. Um, so it was really neat seeing a person actually benefit from that. But from a pharmacologic standpoint, we're going to talk about the early treatment. Yeah, he was he was actually really young, um, which is really kind of sad, kind of like you know um, uh, Michael J. Fox and whatnot. Um, so we'll look at the treatment for early uncomplicated Parkinson's, and then more late stage complicated. We're more doing more palliative sort of care for these patients here. Um, in order to treat the early uncomplicated Parkinson's disease, disease patients, we're going to look at two main ways to manage this. So there's one kind of paradigm we can look at in terms of uh, trying to protect the neurons that they still have. The so neuroprotection is what we're going to try to do there. And two agents we can use here include monoamine oxidase B inhibitors, and dopamine agonist. Okay, so replacing the dopamine they don't have. And then symptomatic management will include anticholinergics. You see your monoamine oxidase B inhibitors, again, COMT inhibitors, and then our dopamine agonists will fall into this category as well. And then some dopamine precursors. Okay. Again, this is just for your for categorization purposes. You can look back at this and sort of um, kind of collate them all in your mind there. So let's look at ways we can try to protect the neurons these patients have and try to slow down a uh, disease here. Um, just as a caveat, all these patients at some point are likely going to require uh, therapy with levodopa. Levodopa is like the gold standard, most effective treatment, but we're going to try to hold off on using that as long as possible because once they go on levodopa, chances are they don't get off. And once it loses efficacy, you kind of don't have anything else to really go with, unfortunately. Okay, so kind of keep that in mind. Anyway, so if we can start early, if we get an early diagnosis for these patients, which may or may not happen, uh, we can try and, or, and go ahead and initiate some of these uh, neuroprotective features or neuroprotective drugs to try to hold off on how long we need until we, we start levodopa, basically, in order to help treat these dyskinesias that patients are experiencing. The one way we can do that is to replace the dopamine that they don't have anymore. They're not releasing. And so we have dopamine agonists that can help out with that. This will help to sort of delay how long it takes before we go on levodopa. Um, and then we can see with the monoamine oxidase B inhibitors, instead of replacing dopamine that they don't have, we try to decrease the metabolism of the dopamine that they do have. So if you go back to that slide with the neuron there, you can see that by decreasing the metabolism of it, you'd have more dopamine available, and then hopefully help to prevent, um, uh, you know, you have more dopamine which will treat the symptoms. But the other idea here too is that uh, there's a thought that monoamine oxidase B activity, when it breaks down dopamine, may cause free radical formation to occur. Uh, free radicals basically means it's a reactive oxygen species, which can cause uh, just wreak havoc within a, a, a nerve, uh, causing damage to proteins and things like that. So uh, by decreasing that amount of metabolism going on, you can may be able to decrease free radical formation and keep that neuron intact for longer. Uh, free radical formation was also the name of my prog rock band back in high school, if anyone was curious. Don't look it up though. Um, you, you won't like the music. I'm just kidding. Um, anyway, so just to show you an example of what this would look like. So you see dopamine here being metabolized by monoamine oxidase B. Notice you get this uh, metabolite dopac, but you also have H2O2, which if anyone is uh, not familiar with, that's hydrogen peroxide, right? Hydrogen peroxide is going to break down into water and then one of these free radicals, uh, an oxygen basically or a, a OH group with a, a free free electron that's going to go and try to bind to proteins and DNA and all kinds of stuff. This stuff is really bad. So whenever you hear about someone um, using an antioxidant, this is what it's trying to inhibit the activity of, of is these free radicals um, that are strong oxidizers, basically. Okay. Anyway, um, so drugs we can use to try to inhibit uh, monoamine oxidase B is going to include selegiline and then resagiline. And so basically, um, again, using them for neuroprotective and symptomatic benefits here. Um, interestingly enough, selegiline is uh, also metabolized to uh, L-methamphetamine and L-amphetamine. And so it, you could actually have someone who gets a urine drug screen on this medication and they would test positive for amphetamines, right? So it's not something you want to test positive for accidentally. So it's, again, good to uh, educate on those sorts of things, especially if they're trying to get a new job or something that, hey, you know, if it run into any problems you know, show them your script and you should be good to go from that standpoint, right? Um, 
a lot of things you might expect to see here include things like agitation, insomnia, hallucinations, which makes sense because of the amphetamine-like effects here. Um, and also, you're going to find that with a lot of these dopaminergic drugs, orthostatic hypotension is quite common. And so you're going to see that um, basically by modifying these uh, the activity of dopamine, that can kind of have some big issues in terms of their blood pressure and trying to regulate that. And especially these older patients anyway, they're probably fall risk already. And so that's just going to worsen that. So again, you definitely want to make sure they're educated to watch out for that uh, side effect there. Sagiline, as mentioned, is another one that uh, does not have any of the amphetamine derivatives. So you won't find um, any of that showing up on a urine drug screen, for instance. Uh, probably not quite as effective as selegiline, but also fewer adverse drug reactions um, so it might be a little bit better tolerated for more mild disease there both of them can uh, have a risk for causing serotonin syndrome because they prevent the breakdown of serotonin um, I'm going to talk about that a lot more later on in the behavioral section normally most years I would have covered uh, behavioral already um, but we'll talk about that later just know that it's a syndrome of way too much serotonin and we'll talk about how you treat it and, and detect it later on someone had a question it said, uh, why is constipation a cholinergic effect? Wouldn't an increase in acetylcholine increase gastric motility? Or am I thinking the wrong way? You're thinking the exact right way. Um, that's just one of those things where um, some of the effects were consistent with cholinergic, uh, with uh, muscarinic activity. Uh, some of them were not necessarily. So constipation was just one of those things that, um, you know, I don't know if we know the exact mechanism for why that occurs. We just see that it happens pretty commonly. But, you know, you're absolutely right in your thinking there. Uh, so someone's asking, are these two dopamine agonists or are these going to be monoamine oxidase B inhibitors or something else? No, these are both monoamine oxidase B inhibitors here, right? Um, so these are MAOB inhibitors. Um, yeah, so we'll get into the dopamine agonists in just a few moments. Okay, so that's the first one I wanted to talk about. Um, so again, uh, for more mild disease, you could use these as monotherapy in some cases. So if you caught someone really early, you could utilize them uh, to help manage the symptoms and again, try to... Uh, delay how long it takes before you start levodopa and, and carbidopa as we'll see in a little bit there's a lot of drug interactions that happen here uh, mainly it's going to be other drugs that increase the activity of serotonin uh, norepinephrine and things like that because they're preventing the breakdown of those catecholamines so anything else causing an increase in uh, levels of those catecholamines as well is going to cause an interaction so you can see things like hypertension um you know hallucinations anxiety you know seizures in some rare cases and all of that so um, some of these drugs we have not covered yet um other ones we're going to cover in a little bit later on but like for instance other monoamine oxidase inhibitors if you haven't covered this with dr austin yet you will soon i imagine um, but these are kind of really old school um uh, antidepressant drugs that would do the same thing as something like selegiline and you can see how they'd be pretty synergistic and cause side effects here um, st john's wort is a, an herbal supplement we'll talk about used for um, a depression later on so for this slide here I, I probably wouldn't ask you very specific interaction uh, but i would want you to know that if you had a monoamine oxygen b inhibitor on board and you had something else that increased levels of those catecholamines like dopamine, serotonin, norepinephrine, epinephrine, that you would see an interaction there. I would just tell you, hey, this drug increases serotonin levels. What kind of inter what drug would be most likely to interact with this? And you'd say something like selegiline or risagiline. Okay, that's kind of what I want you to know from that standpoint. We'll get into all these drugs later on. What's also interesting too is that you can have, uh, if you have an increase in the precursors for dopamine, um, that that can also lead to overproduction of it, which can, uh, if you have overproduction of these catecholamines and you're blocking the breakdown of those catecholamines, you can then see that you could run into some interactions here. And so this is what we call a tyramine reaction. We're going to see this is also really important. We talk about the monoamine oxidase inhibitors for depression, but here it's worth mentioning too. It's probably a little less, um, clinically important just because we're only uh, inhibiting monoamine oxidase B, um, but because there's a B, you know, there's probably also an A, and it's the non-selective ones that we use for depression that are more likely to cause an interaction here. But I like to talk about tyramine reactions because all these foods contain tyramine, uh, the foods to avoid, uh, and they are a precursor to forming catecholamines like dopamine, norepinephrine, serotonin, etc. Um, I like to call these the bougie foods. Hopefully that helps it stick in your mind. These are things like um, aged cheeses and meats. This includes like things like fava beans, um, uh, includes your red wines, uh, and then things like sauerkraut, soybeans, things like that. All of these foods contain a lot of um, tyramine. So if you had someone who's on risagiline, for instance, and they want to go to a fancy dinner party, there might be a lot of foods there they have to avoid, okay? Okay. 
Um, or they could find alternatives that would be reasonable to have. So things like fresh meat, you know, poultry is fine. Um, something like white wine would all be reasonable. It's really a lot of these like aged cheeses and, and meats and, and things like that. They're going to have those higher amounts of tyramine. So just be aware of the kind of uh, kind of obvious foods you'd want to avoid versus ones that could be reasonable to have for patients who are taking a monoamine oxidase inhibitor. Okay. okay. Um, some other things we could do in order to treat the, um, the trimmer, we could actually have uh, our anticholinergics, right? So we can use basically... If we know these patients are having too much acetylcholine activity, we'll give a drug to block that, okay? Uh, so a couple ones we have available to us are gonna include uh, benstropine, trihexyphenidyl, and then diphenhydramine. If you're like, diphenhydramine, that's a antihistamine. That's right, but if you recall, it does have pretty strong anti-muscarinic activity as well, anticholinergic activity, so it will help to um, prevent that. And these will actually come up again when we talk about antipsychotics later on this semester. But if you have a patient who has really like minimal hypokinesia, but they have that resting tremor, and that's sort of like the main issue that they're having, then this could be a reasonable thing to start up for them. So you could have a patient who just starts out on anticholinergic before they start anything that could even affect dopamine overtly, okay? Just be aware of common side effects, right? Remember the mad as a hatter, dry as a beet, or dry as a bone, uh, red as a beet, uh, hot as a hair, um, what's the other one? I can't remember which ones I just said, but you guys, have, we've been over that mnemonic before. So just remember, those are the big things you're going to see. So dry mouth, constipation, urinary retention, everything's going to be dried out. And remember, um, the anticholinergics are not great for elderly patients who have like, um, you know, dementia and, and things like that, because it tends to cause uh, more mental status changes for them. So again, if it's like a younger patient with just tremor, minimal hypokinesia, an anticholinergic might be a really good option for those patients there, okay? Um, so benzotropine, triaxiphenidyl, diphenhydramine are probably the most common ones you want to run into there, okay? Okay, um, other couple of drugs we have here. So we have one um, called amantadine or Symmetrol. This one, we don't really know why it works necessarily, but we do know that it has some amphetamine-like activity to actually help increase the release of dopamine. So in that way, it kind of helps to release some of the symptoms for these patients. Uh, also has a little bit of anticholinergic activity too, which is beneficial for the tremor aspects of it. Um, so this is why you're going to see it used um, really early for more mild cases, either in combination with something else or maybe even by itself potentially. Um, it is also an NMDA antagonist, so it's actually a glutamate receptor. What clinical benefits that means for these Parkinson patients, I don't really know. Um, but the 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 increase in dopamine activity and anticholinergic effects are the primary things we're looking for there, okay? Um, and it could also help out with some dyskinesias induced by levodopa, which we'll look at a little bit later on there uh, when, once we talk about that drug. Um, a lot of side effects associated with this, you know, you can have some anxiety, insomnia, um, and again, the anticholinergic side effects like we mentioned on the last slide there. And again, a lot of these drugs you're gonna find over time as these neurons get more and more, um, more and more deterioration occurs to these neurons that you're gonna to develop tolerance to the point where these drugs just don't really work anymore, even if you keep increasing the dose, unfortunately. All right, so let's switch gears a little bit and talk about the dopamine agonist. Talk about a few things that can help either with the anticholinergic or help with the increased acetylcholine. Talked about how we can inhibit monoamine oxidase B. Now let's talk about how we can replace dopamine that they are not producing themselves. Okay, um, we're going to see all of these are going to be pretty um, broad spectrum, meaning they affect D1, D2, and D3 receptors. They affect all of them. And there's going to be two categories we mentioned here. There's the ergot derivatives and the non-ergot derivatives. If anyone knows what ergot means, you can put that in the chat. I want to see if anyone knows. And I'll get to it in just a moment here. Um, again, these are going to be um, potentially first line for patients. You could either you could use instead of a uh, monoamine oxidase B inhibitor potentially. However, it won't be as effective as a combination of carbidopa and levodopa, which we'll get into in just a moment. That's that gold standard drug that I mentioned that almost all patients will need to be on. Um, however, this could slow down the time it takes and, or, and take a longer time before you actually need to switch them over to levodopa. Okay? Anyway, um, just be aware if you're going to be adding this onto anything that is also increasing dopamine levels, you do want to drop the dose because they could have too much synergy there. It can cause some side effects. You would want to be cautious with that. And you'll see that the, the side effect is going to be pretty similar between um, whether you're blocking monoamine oxidase B or just replacing the dopamine they're missing by giving them basically something that activates the receptors. Um, you know, confusion, hallucinations, orthostatic hypotension, those are going to be pretty uh, similar amongst all of them. Um, notice as well that there can have some side effects like um, peripheral edema. It may not be great if they have something like, you know, CHF, for instance. Um, they also can have this like punding that they do. Punding is kind of like, it's kind of an interesting side effect. You can look it up, but basically where they are, um, they like to order things. 
Um, so for instance, if you had like a bunch of toys or something, they would order them from like smallest to largest, for instance, or they would like to order things. Um, you know, it's kind of an interesting side effect. I see my kids do that sometimes too. They'll like take all their toys and just go like straight in order. Um, just for, I don't know, for funsies, I guess. But anyway, so that's something you can see, um, with these agents here. Um, we will see. Ah, uh, there you go, Richard. Thank you for mentioning that. Ergot is a fun guy. He's pretty fun to hang out with. Um, I like to say I'm like a fun guy sometimes because I grow on you after a while. I hope somebody <laughs> probably saying, uh, no, I don't think so. Um, another uh, bad thing you can see here for the ergot derivatives, which I'll show you uh, what they are in a moment here, is they can actually cause this retroperitoneal fibrosis and some valve issues as well. So this is one of these, something you definitely want to monitor for. Oh, very good, Jackson. Yes, that is exact what I'm talking about here. Maybe you guys jumped ahead on the slides or something. So um, when I say ergot derivatives, I mean that it's derived from the ergot fungus. And so this is really interesting. Um, the ergot derivative we mainly use here is called bromocryptine. Uh, and so this is an infected piece of rye that had um, ergot uh, fungus growing on it. Um, so this kind of goes back. I don't know if anyone's heard of the the idea of St. Anthony's fire. I always thought this was like a really cool kind of uh, story from back in like the medieval days back when, um, you know, if you were afflicted with the disease state, it was obviously some sort of um, uh, curse from the devil or something uh, divine in, in nature there or in, in origin. And so basically what would happen was these people would um, eat bread that was infected with this, uh, this infected rye, and they would start to develop side effects from that. And what's interesting is one of the things you'll find is that it causes vasoconstriction. This increase in dopamine activity causes vasoconstriction. So it would vasoconstrict the ends of their, um, their fingers and the toes, and they would get like extremely... Like they feel like they're on fire, right? They feel like it was very hot. It, um, they could cause gangrene, could cause amputations. And so they were like, man, I have this like this uh, divine in affliction. I probably need to go and pray somewhere. And so basically what they would do is they'd go on pilgrimage. They'd try to go to St. Anthony's Cathedral at the time. At least this is the story. I don't know if it's apocryphal or not, but um, it's a story as I remember it. Um, they would then go on this uh, pilgrimage to try to go to this church so they could pray and get rid of this affliction. And as they got away from the infected bread, guess what happened? Well, their symptoms improved. So by the time they got there and prayed, they're like, wow, I'm cured. So pretty interesting to see how um, that kind of got to start. Yeah, some people think it might have had something to do with the Salem witch trials. Um, who can say, though? But pretty interesting stuff, I think. But at least it helps me remember some of the side effects you run into. So bromocryptine is the main ergot derivatives. And then for the non-ergots, and we'll actually we'll find more ergots um, when we talk about migraines in just a little bit here. Uh, for the non-ergots, we have a few. We have permixapole, we have ropinerol, and then reticotine. Um, reticotine is kind of interesting because it can be used as a transdermal product. So that can help out with these patients who may have memory impairment um, to help because it would last a few days potentially. And then we have another one here called apomorphine, which I mentioned before you could use as a diagnostic agent. Um, but we can also find that this will be useful for late stage Parkinson's as well. I'll get into in just a little bit later. It's as its name implies, it is related to morphine, but it actually doesn't have any opioid qualities. So again, if a patient is not producing enough dopamine on their own, you can give this to then activate those dopamine receptors for them, okay? So we have means of preventing breakdown of dopamine, and now we find a way of replacing with something else that's gonna be interacting with those receptors, right? So you can kind of see the treatment modalities we're um, using here so far. Now, the uh, main thing we're going to run into here is that most patients are going to require a combination of levodopa, carbidopa at some point. The brand name for this is Cinemet, so I'll probably just call it Cinemet from here on out. But um, basically, what you're going to find is that levodopa is a precursor to dopamine, just like we saw uh, before. Now, this is able, you can take this orally, and it can cross the blood-brain barrier totally fine, no problem. However, you're going to find that peripherally, um, it's going to get broken down. It's going to get metabolized before it ever has a chance to take it up into the brain. Okay. Um, and also peripherally, when it gets converted over to dopamine, it's going to cause things like arrhythmias, nausea, vomiting, hypotension, things like that. However, if there's a way to make sure that it gets up into the brain, it can then be converted by that LAAD enzyme and then turned into dopamine to be uh, released from those neurons. Right. So that's where carbidopa comes into place. Carbidopa is a peripheral inhibitor of that LAAD enzyme. So it prevents the metabolism of L-dopa into dopamine peripherally so that it can then cross the brain and then get into those neurons where it's needed. Carbidopa itself does not cr cross the blood-brain barrier, right? So it stays out in the periphery, does its job, and allows levodopa to get in and to do its thing. Um, and also helps to reduce the side effects because levodopa doesn't um, have the side effects unless it gets converted into dopamine in the first place. That's basically how this drug is going to be working. 
Um, Jackson was saying, uh, would patients taking apomorphine test positive for opioid metabolites on tox screens? I don't know. Um, I don't see too many people on it, to be honest. Um, I'd have to do a check to see if that's a common one. There's uh, articles out there you can look up. Uh, that will uh, do common uh, false positives and false negatives for drug screens. A lot of it may be dependent on the assay, though. So the assay itself, if it's sensitive to that uh, particular compound or not, um, I'm not familiar if that comes up, but it's a reasonable question to think that it could. Um, but you, know, you have to do a double check on that. Another thing too, if you're working clinically, um, it's always a good idea to get friendly with um, you know everyone that you work with, obviously, but especially different departments that could help you out. And so, like if you get friendly with like your lab people, um, they can tell you stuff like, okay, well, you know, uh, this test actually will be positive for this and negative for this, and give you a better idea of when you're working, you know, how your tests are actually performing in a lot of cases. So something to think about. Um, someone said ergot looks like something you would not want to see crawling around on your ceiling at night. Yeah, I guess I should probably take care of that. I mean, you guys can't see my ceiling, but boy, it's just covered. Not great. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, let's see here. So the other thing too, uh, that's interesting with, with cinnamon is sort of the variable pharmacokinetics to go along with it. So what's interesting is that this is taken orally and it's absorbed through the duodenum the duodenum, however you want to call it. I always think about the family guy where he gets, um, uh, Peter gets hit in the duodenum. He's like, oh, my duodenum. So I always call it that. But anyway, so um, there are only so many transporters that can absorb uh, levodopa. And remember, this is like a precursor protein kind of product here, an amino acid basically. And so it's going to be competing for the same amino acid transporters as all the other proteins in your diet are. And if you have like a big meaty lunch, for instance, all those amino acids are going to be uh, saturating all of those transporters. L-DOPA is not going to have an easy time crossing. And so because of that, we're going to find um, that we can sometimes modify our scheduling for these things, maybe try to uh, move our meal times around, or perhaps we could try to mo uh, move when we're giving the drugs around in order to make sure that those transporters are re uh, ready and accepting for the L-DOPA that we're giving them, okay? So uh, just one thing to consider there. I'll talk more about that in just a little bit. Um, also, you're going to find um, that... Uh, to be able to cross that blood-brain barrier as well, there's going to be um, some challenges, especially if you have too many amino acids trying to cross there. So that's one thing to consider. And then the half-life is really important here too, because ideally you'd want this drug to last all day long. However, you can see here the half-life is pretty um, not not great on its own, only about an hour or so. You can see though that by combining with something like carbidopa, that'll take longer for it to be metabolized and gotten out of the system. And then there's actually another drug here we'll talk about a little bit later called entacapone, which further helps to inhibit its metabolism and allows it to last for longer. That would be important too, because you'll see that some patients, as they get more progressive, they'll take their dose in the morning, for instance, and you may find that before their next dose, say 12 hours later, it starts to wear off around eight to 10 hours, right? Because the level's starting to dip down too much and their dopamine levels have now diminished to a point where their hypokinesia is, is resuming. So we'll find some ways we can try to uh, manage that, okay? So you may find um, that, you know, L-DOPA, like people, like they do so well on this drug that like almost like completely fixes them, especially really early on because it's giving them all that extra dopamine that not, they weren't able to produce anymore. Um, unfortunately, they're going to find that it will be, um, there's a period of time where it's going to be working really well. We call that the uh, kind of the Parkinson's honeymoon or the cinnamon honeymoon. And then eventually you're going to find that as those neurons continue to degrade, that you're going to be able to convert less and less of that L-DOPA into dopamine. And so the efficacy of the drug goes down over the course of years or so. And so that's going to be a challenge, but initially really, really effective. And so if we can do anything to try to prevent them from needing to go on cinnamon, to hold that off for a couple of years, that's going to be beneficial. So that's why we use things like the monoamine oxidase B inhibitors. That's why we use things like um, uh, the dopamine agonists in order to help uh, hold off on how long we need before we need the, the cinnamon, basically, right? But very effective for treating all the symptoms of Parkinson's disease there. And almost all patients are going to require use of this drug at some point. So it's a matter of um, not if they're going to go on the drug, but when they're going to need to go on it. And again, all these side effects are very similar to what we saw with anything that increases dopamine activity, hallucinations, dyskinesias, orthostatic hypotension. All that is the same amongst all these drugs here. So it's pretty easy to memorize their side effect profiles at least. Um said, is L-DOPA, uh, levodopa considered a dopamine agonist because it's a precursor to it, or is it in a different class? I would put levodopa in a different class because it doesn't directly activate dopamine receptors, right? So I wouldn't call it a dopamine agonist. I would call it a dopamine precursor, right? Um, 
So whereas with something like promixapole, can go and activate the dopamine receptors directly, uh, levodopa has to be converted first in the neuron in order for it to be packaged up in those vesicles and then be released out into the synapse like normal dopamine would be. Okay. All right. As I mentioned, we use a combination here. Typically, um, we will see that you can only have a max of so much carbidopa, but we'll try to keep uh, increasing the amount of levodopa those patients are getting there. Typically, they'll be getting like two to three times a day, just depending on how well it's working for them. Um, if they start to see, you know, that the symptoms are starting to re uh, reappear towards the end of the dosing interval, you may need to dose it more frequently as the case may be. There's some controlled release uh, products as well, which can help to provide for a longer duration of action, which may help with compliance. If you only have to take it twice a day versus three times a day, that can be beneficial. But also think about too, like with more um, developed and, and more progressive Parkinson's disease, even things like swallowing and talking gets very difficult because it becomes difficult for those patients to move those muscles um, in order to have a coordinated swallow, right? That's why you worry about things like aspiration and things in those patients. And so here's an example of something called Parcopa, which is a levodopa carbidopa compound product that's an oral disintegrating tablet. That way they can just put it underneath the tongue, it will then dissolve, and they can just kind of swallow it passively or just absorb it from, uh, uh, from the mouth, and that will kind of uh, you know, bypass the issues of them having to swallow something like a tablet, for instance. Now, um, again, there's probably some controversy about whether you should just start someone on levodopa or not. I think for the most part um, that uh, most people would benefit from some other therapy prior to starting Cinemet. Um, you know, there is concern that if you start someone on Cinemet early, that more and more of that LAED is going to be working on that dopamine to convert it uh, into free radicals. So some people feel that giving them Cinemet will hasten the degradation of those neurons, which is why um, you're going to find some people will want to use those other therapies first, right? That's kind of the common way we're going to be doing these things here. But we do know that levodopa reduces mortality in these patients because it is quite so effective at what it does there. Um, but again, that's why we want to use the dopamine agonist or monoamine oxidase B inhibitors first for neuroprotection and then switch them over to levodopa later on. That's kind of the common sort of paradigm here for management for these patients here. Okay. Uh, one other class of drugs here for Parkinson's we'll see is called a COM-T inhib inhibitor as a catecholamine O-methyltransferase. This is a drug we're going to use to increase the half-life of levodopa. If you go back to that neuron there, you saw a COM-T help to break that down. Um, so if we can inhibit that, it'll prolong the half-life. Um, so basically, it would only be given with levodopa, carbidopa, generally not by itself for the most part. Um, we don't have too many of these. I'll show you. Um, and tacopone is probably going to be the main one you're going to see there. Um, in terms of adverse effects, it's mainly going to be due to potentiating the effects of levodopa. So whatever side effects they'd be getting from the cinnamon will just be kind of amplified by this. And also, interestingly enough, it can turn the urine a sort of brown orangish color, uh, which again, not something you want to have happen to a patient without them being aware of it first, right? You might think they're having on a rhabdomyolysis or something uh, if that were to happen. We have two here, um, tolcapone and entacapone. I have seen more often than not entacapone is going to be used here, mainly because tolcapone has an issue with hepatotoxicity. So this one will not be used too, too frequently just due to the effects they can have on the liver, as whereas entacapone is relatively um, free of those side effects, but maybe something you still want to monitor for. Okay, so how would this treatment algorithm go? Well, basically, once you have your diagnosis, you kind of figure out, okay, what uh, symptoms are they really having here? Um, if they're having no significant impairment, maybe start them off on something like a monoamine oxidase B inhibitor for that neuroprotective effects. Like resagiline would be pretty reasonable there, okay? Um, what if they're just having tremor? Well, if it's just tremor and they're less than 65 years of age because they're not really elderly at that point, then you can consider using something like, you know, benztropine, right, or trihexyphenidyl. If they're over 65, that's where you're worried about the mental status effects that the anticholinergics can cause. And so at that point, you may just consider going straight to levodopa carbidopa, okay? If they're not really having tremors, so much is their problem, but they're having the bradykinesia, and then at that point, you may consider just going to a dopamine agonist, especially with the younger patients, okay? If these are not working, then at that point, again, everything falls back to levodopa carbidopa, right? Um, you know, if they're seeing more so the postural instability, you know, again, a dopamine agonist may be beneficial for them. Also, physical therapy is going to be one of those other non-pharmacologic methods that is going to be utilized as well, right? So again, every, all roads go to Cinemet at some point, but for some of these patients, it may be reasonable to use some of these other agents first, especially in the younger patients um, there. Now, what normally happens is you'll start off in the early stages of, of Parkinson's disease with monotherapy, so maybe something like a selegiline, for instance, 
They will then require multiple drugs in order to manage their symptoms. And at some point, they'll start on levodopa, right? And you'll find this is the, the honeymoon I, that I mentioned where a lot of their side effects or a lot of their effects of the disease are being ameliorated. They feel a lot better. Everything is going very well. And then eventually, you have a loss of effect where the other drugs are not really going to be um, all that useful anymore. And they may just be on levodopa, carbidopa by itself without monotherapy. And so we also find that there's some late complicated issues that happen with the use of Cinemet. You have issues where maybe the drug is wearing off too early. Maybe the drug is taking a long time to have onset. I'll show you some graphs here in a moment that looks at that. And you can even have patients who have this freezing that occurs due to re their refractory symptoms, right? Where basically they have this catatonic sort of effect that occurs where they can't move anything, okay? Now on the other side too, you run into the issue where you can have too much dopamine activity and that way you can develop dyskinesias where they're having inappropriate movements that they're not trying to initiate, right? So you have too much movement now as opposed to not enough, right? So again, you gotta find that Goldilocks sort of point there where uh, the drug is uh, working but not being too effective where it's causing dyskinesias to occur here. Well, look at this, I'll, I think I'll show you some graphs here. I'll show you what that looks like in a little bit. Some of this may be due to peak dose effects, meaning the peak level that you hit is too high, causing some of these effects here. And then for patients, especially those who are having dysarthria, dysphagia, where they're not able to really swallow appropriately, that's where using oral solutions is good. Um, sometimes they can use sub-Q apomorphine infusions, uh, and that's where we need to consider things like physical therapy and maybe even surgery in some cases. Okay, so I, I like this slide here because it kind of shows you um, the, the changes that occur in terms of drug therapy for patients who are getting levodopa. So if you imagine the line here is going to be the level of drug, and then you're going to have what we call the response threshold, which is going to be when they actually get the benefits of the drug, so the bradykinesia is, is resolving. And then you also have this dyskinesia threshold, so above which is when you're going to start to develop um, uh, side effects of you know inappropriate movements uh, sometimes it's like tongue smacking all kinds of different um, uh, dyskinesias there so early on you're going to find there's a good long-term response to the drug but also has low risk of dyskinesia everything is looking pretty good for these patients here as time goes on you're going to find that the actual duration of response is shortened so you may find that they have to give the drug more frequently because it wears off more quickly you may need to give it maybe three times a day instead of twice a day for instance right um, you're also going to see that this risk for causing dyskinesia is going to um, lower as well. So it means your risk of causing dyskinesia is, is, is going to be higher. So you may say like, okay, well, this is wearing off early. I'm just going to give more drug and thus it should last for longer. Yeah, but then you're more likely to cause the dyskinesias. Okay, so it's kind of the trade-off you're going to see with that. And then finally, when you get really advanced, you're going to see here that it takes longer for them to actually even get to the point where they're having good response. You're going to see that the response is really short-lived, and they're more likely to get the dyskinesia. They get more um, uh, more likely to be symptomatic that due to those peak dose sort of effects there. So you have a really narrow therapeutic window where the drug is really being all that effective without causing side effects. Okay. And again, this is kind of the unfortunate thing with um, Parkinson's. We can't really fix this. Like the neurons are going to go at some point. It's just a matter of how long until that, that actually happens and keeping the drugs um, working effectively for them until that occurs, basically. So what can we do if they're wearing off too early? So if we're losing these presynaptic neurons. Uh, we're having fewer neurons that can convert levodopa to dopamine. This is where we can do some help. So we can try using things like intacapone which helps the uh, levodopa last for longer. That's one way we can do it. We could uh, try adding a dopamine agonist, for instance. It will help to activate those receptors. So that way we don't have to worry about the levodopa. Um, or may, we may be able to administer the cinnamon more frequently. And again, think about giving something six to eight times a day. Like it's really difficult to do that from a compliance standpoint, but maybe required, okay? We could also do things like, um, you know, cinnamon oral solutions, where you could tr either try to dissolve the tablets or you could give them an oral solution. That way they can um, have an easier time swallowing. We could do a monomyoxidase B inhibitor. We could do controlled release formulations. A lot of different things we can try doing that. And even kind of the more um, uh, sort of invasive ones include doing something like an apomorphine injection, where they may have a continuous sub-Q infusion of the drug to activate those dopamine receptors, or they could even have a duodenal levodopa infusion. So you can actually infuse it right there into the duodenums uh, to avoid having to kind of go orally in the first place. So one thing you can try there. So um, if they're having what they call an off dystonia, uh, meaning that basically the drug is wearing off too much, you're getting kind of that freezing sort of effect there. This is where we can do things like adding a bedtime dose of Cinemat. So that way when they go to sleep, the drug is still working. So by the time they wake up, their levels aren't so low that they have that kind of really significant um, uh, kind of freezing happening, that dystonia 
other things we can do is try adding on things like dopamine agonists. Um, you know, they can take a cinnamon right upon rising in the morning. And even in some cases, certain muscle groups in particular are going to be problematic. They can use something like Botox, right? So botulinum toxin, which is a really potent um, paralytic agent. Um, you can use it in certain muscle groups to allow for relaxation of those muscles, basically kind of partially paralyzing them. And uh, most people are familiar with Botox being used for um, aesthetic purposes. Uh, however, we have lots of other things we can use them for. And we'll talk about this again, like in migraines, a little bit later on. If they're having sort of an unpredictable on or off, again, a lot of this is going to be similar in terms of other drugs we can try to administer, like monamine oxidase B inhibitors, things like that. One of the other things to consider, too, is protein redistribution. Um, so this is a case where you could actually have their protein maybe being uh, put off into one part of the day. Um, to where that won't interact with their uh, levodopa and, and prevent it from being absorbed right in the duodenum. Uh, I remember we actually did a, a thing uh, a couple of years ago where we actually did um, some of our students did a talk with uh, people like a Parkinson support group. And I remember one of the people were, were talking about it and they're just like, yeah, like it really stings. Like I used to love my eggs in the morning, but I can't have them anymore because then my sentiment doesn't work as well. Right. So just like little things like that, that it really can affect your quality of life if you Really love your eggs in the morning, and now you can't do that anymore. It's kind of a, a loss of that normality for for these people, right? Uh, oh, a couple questions here. Um, someone said, wife over 65, you go straight to levodopa, carbidopa. Um, that's typically due to the fact that side effect profiles for things like anticholinergics and dopamine agonists tend to be unfavorable. So, for instance, like with the dopamine agonist, the orthostatic hypotension becomes a risk as you get elderly. Um, the uh, anticholinergic effects on mental status become kind of a problem in the more elderly patients. So that's why the consideration is to skip it and go to levodopa, carbidopa. Now, if I had someone who's like super fit, like totally with it, you know, 70-year-old, maybe they don't need to go that straight. But uh, that's uh, typically what you would see for the majority of typical elderly patients there. Some says, could you uh, please explain why we'd use a COMT inhibitor with levodopa? Yes, because it uh, helps to prevent it from being broken down. It's almost like 106. Let me see here. Go back to this slide here. Um, basically, what you can do is L-dopa coming in here. If you can prevent its breakdown by inhibiting COMT, this allows the half-life to be longer. Oops, I'm sorry. I'm fit over here. Um, so L-dopa is coming into the neuron here, and it gets broken down by COMT. So by inhibiting this, the half-life for L-dopa is going to be longer. So it'll stick around for longer. It'll work better. Okay? That's why we do that. Uh, let's see. So as far as the treatment algorithm goes, what do we need to do with the order of treatment in the um, in relation to what symptoms are exhibiting? So if I, had, if I asked you a test question that said, you know, you have a 52-year-old uh, male patient who uh, has been diagnosed with Parkinson's and they're complaining of tremor at rest, what's the most appropriate medication to go with? I may put like levodopa, carbidopa. I may put apomorphine. I may put um, uh, reticotine. And then I'll put, you know, trihexyphenidol. Your goal would be to determine, okay, well, what's the most appropriate drug for just tremor and a relatively young patient? Um, yeah, the anticholinergics will be the one to go with. Or I say a patient is um, developing or has been on, you know, trihexyphenidyl for the past three years, but now they're complaining of hypo, uh, hypokinesia and they're, you know, 67 years old. What do you want to switch them over to? Then maybe at that point, levodopa, carbidopa is going to be the best option, right? I could put it as your options in tacopone. I could put uh, another anticholinergic, you know, and then levodopa, carbidopa. So that would be your goal to determine that would be the one to go with, right? I think most students probably say, well, I'm just going to pick levodopa, carbidopa, all the time and then the odds will be in my favor that that's going to be right whether that works or not i can't say for sure anyway so um other things to consider the dyskinesias um, by lowering the cinemat dose that can really help out to prevent those peak dose effects as i mentioned there um, and then by discontinuing other drugs that sort of potentiate the effects of levodopa. So if you can get rid of the COMT inhibitors or the monamine oxidase B inhibitors, that will help to get rid of these peak dose effects because the level won't rise quite as high there. Okay. Um, and again, what you can find is um, by switching to a CR formulation too, this is a big one where it will help to reduce the peak effect, but it'll last for longer. So that's another way we can try to get rid of that and allow for the drug to have more of a, a smooth sort of uh, rise and fall and prevent the dyskinesias from happening there. Okay, so little things to consider with that. Uh, and again, when you're monitoring, uh, you know, try to get an idea for like what they're eating and when, when they're administering the drugs there, um, ensure that they actually have good understanding of 
complicated drug regimen. So either with a healthcare provider, uh, or I'm sorry, a healthcare uh, giver who is with them, like a family member, or if you're they're doing it themselves, like have them do that teach back method where they make sure they can tell you how to take the medications to make sure they know what they're talking about there. And so again, we're monitoring for adverse effects. We're looking for non-compliance, and of course, screening for other non-motor complications uh, that may be uh, benefited with things like you know PT, OT, you know things like that. Okay. Uh, so any questions on that so far? Okay, I think I can get through a little bit more of this. So uh, up next, we'll talk about Alzheimer's disease. Uh, so what is Alzheimer's disease? Well, we know it to be you know this kind of progressive memory impairment that happens here. Um, this is basically due to the loss of this hippocampal and cortical uh, neurons that are associated with that memory and cognition, right? I think most people are familiar with like the memory effects, but we're also gonna see that over time, um, a lot of the, the cortical effects of being able to uh, plan out their day or being able to problem solve is going to uh, diminish over time. And that can eventually lead to all the way of like, you know, basically, um, you know, their ability to take care of themselves, their ability to talk, all that things can eventually um, uh, diminish as well. So it's a really nasty progressive disease. Um, you've had some family members that have dealt with this and it's, you you know, really, really, uh, really sad disease state to, to deal with for sure uh, for the uh, patients and the, and the families. Um, anyway, so again, in terms of the full pathophysiology, we may not have the full answer down yet, but a lot of it's thought to some of these changes that happen here. So for instance, I'm um, get some of these tau proteins that will build up and eventually you can develop these plaques that form. Basically you have these degrading neurons and you have these immune cells, this kind of inflammatory response. And, and that's kind of the common thing you'd actually end up seeing like on a post-mortem sort of, uh, uh, you know, examination of the brain. You find a lot of these uh, neurofibrillary tangles and plaques and all of that. So, and unfortunately, we don't have a lot of good drug therapy. We're going to see here. This is another unfortunate thing where we can treat some of the symptoms, but we, again, we can't fix the ultimate problem of these degrading neurons. And so it's just going to progress regardless of what we do, unfortunately. So uh, the goals, though, for our patients are to try to treat any cognitive difficulties they're having and then try to preserve their function for as long as possible. Because frequently, just like with Parkinson's patients, they may require institutionalization. We know that when you get put into long-term care facilities, you know, things like infection risk goes up. Um, you know, it's not great for their mental status as well to be away from home. And so, and, but unfortunately, it's one of those uh, things that just may have to happen for a lot of patients there. And again, no current things we can do necessarily to try to slow or reverse the disease, unfortunately. So one of the things we're thinking are happening here, why we're having this degradation in, in memory and cognition is due to this cholinergic neurotransmission uh, sort of theory here, okay? And so what we're going to find is, is if you imagine that this is a uh, presynaptic neuron here that releases acetylcholine, and here you have a postsynaptic neuron, you can imagine this is in the hippocampus, um, that we're losing these neurons here. We're not having enough of it being able to uh, transmit these signals here to actually cause memory to, to take place, okay? Now, normally, what breaks down acetylcholine? Well, we have uh, enzymes called acetylcholinesterase. Cholinesterase is going to break it down into choline. Choline can then be taken up, combined with acetyl-CoA, and then you get, boom, acetylcholine again. Okay? So this is the normal cycle that will happen here. Um, what's happening, though, is we're missing these presynaptic neurons, and so no acetylcholine can be released, right? Or they're starting to become degraded uh, due to just time and, and, and the disease itself. So what you might imagine a normal brain to look like versus someone who has Alzheimer's disease is you're basically having good transmission here between the presynaptic to postsynaptic neurons, plenty of acetylcholine. But for those that are having this degradation, we are now losing some of that uh, those neurons. And so now we're only having so much acetylcholine to go around to all the postsynaptic neurons here. So what could we do to try to increase that transmission? Well, we could try to increase the amount of acetylcholine we have available. How could we do that? Well, we can try to prevent the breakdown of it. And so that's where our cholinesterase inhibitors are going to come into play here. Okay, so these are going to be one of the main therapies we're going to have for uh, Alzheimer's. So um, some of the things we're going to be looking at here include long half-life. It would be good if we have long duration of action for these drugs because, again, if they have to take it several times a day and they're having memory impairment, that's going to be a challenge, right? We also want to be really specific for the enzymes, uh, cholinesterase enzymes in the brain and not in everywhere else because if you... Uh, block all the cholinesterase enzymes in the body, it's going to lead to a lot of cholinergic side effects. And we don't want that necessarily, right? We also want the drugs to get into the brain, have their effects there. Um, and then another thing we'll look at is not only the half-life of the drug, but also how um, reversible is it? The longer it lasts, or the more irreversible it is, the longer it's going to last, and that can also help to increase our duration of action here, okay? Okay. 
Uh, Shelby saying, I've seen some exercise studies uh, that seem to slow the progression of Alzheimer's due to increasing BDNF. Um, is that a brain derived uh, something factor? I don't remember what the end is. Uh, I think they were done on mice brains, though. Interesting. Yeah, there probably is something to that. Um, you know, just like if you have people who are, it's almost like, you know, if you don't use it, you lose it sort of thing there. I think, uh, all right, neurotropic factor. Thank you. Um, I think about like, you know, when people, uh, you know, they, they retire and they, they don't work anymore. They kind of like lose that purpose. And it seems like their brains just take a, a major nosedive in terms of function. Um, yeah. So maybe there's something to that with, with exercise as well. It's interesting. Um, truth is we just don't know enough about it, unfortunately. Um, just remember though, that if you had a, uh, cholinesterase inhibitor that was not specific enough, you'd end up seeing a lot of those cholinergic toxidromes peripherally. Um, so that's the dumbbells, if you recall. So that defecation, urination, meiosis, bradycardia, uh, bronchospasm, bronchorrhea, emesis, lacrimation, salivation. I know we've gone over that before, um, but that still stands uh, to reason here. Those are some of the side effects you could potentially see if you were to inhibit cholinesterase um, body-wide, right? So that's why we want something very specific for the brain itself. So the ones that we have are going to be centrally acting, um, and then they're going to be better for more mild to moderate cases of Alzheimer's disease. They help with the memory and cognition, um, but again, they don't do anything to affect the neurodegeneration, unfortunately. They don't necessarily slow down the disease state um, uh, like we would like to find for other kind of conditions that we have here. Uh, that's almost a question. Uh, well, test one also includes rheumatology section. Boy, I hope so, but it depends on how much stuff I can cover. Um, I think we have uh, one more class and then the review session, so we'll see what I can get through. Good question. Um, so anyway, with the acetylcholinesterase here, we're going to see that uh, the predominant form here is going to be within the brain, um, and the one that we're looking for, this ACHE, is going to be specific for hydrolyzing acetylcholine, right? There's a couple of different isoforms. I don't care that you know the difference between them. Just know that we're going to be shooting for um, specifically this G1 form that's going to be in the brain there. Um, and then there's also some other cholinesterase enzymes, things like uh, butyral cholinesterase, uh, that are not necessarily going to be specific for hydrolyzing acetylcholine, but they maybe have some additional benefits here in, in the CNS. Just depends. But here are the main ones we're going to run into. We're going to see that Tacrin is not going to be one we're going to use. I'll just use it as an example of kind of what our old school drugs used to look like. But the three main acetylcholinesterase inhibitors we're going to find here include uh, Denepazil, Rivastigmine, and Galantamine. Uh, notice here that the half-lives may vary amongst these drugs, although some of them, while even Rivastigmine has a short half-life, they can get around that in a different way, which I'll show you. Um, we'll see here in terms of the side effects, most of them are pretty mild because they tend to be more specific for working in the CNS versus peripherally. And then again, you want their dosing frequency to be very low, so that way the patient's not having to take it two, three times a day where they're going to forget to take it. Okay. So uh, denepazil itself, relatively specific for acetylcholinesterase, which is what we're mainly looking for. Uh, and then it's going to be uh, finding that it has a very long half-life. And it's highly protein bound to plasma, so it's in our plasma protein, so it sticks around for a good long time, and that's why it only needs one time daily dosing. So very beneficial from that standpoint. And even if a patient forgot to take it one day, you still would have decent levels around just due to that long half life, and that steady state is going to be sticking around for for quite some time. Okay. Um, however, you may find that because it gets rapidly reversed off of the enzyme itself, that may affect uh, the drug actual uh, the onset of action or the duration of action in the long term. So that may be one of the reasons why you end up seeing that the drug becomes less effective over time is because it may be kind of um, just not sticking onto the enzyme and inhibiting it for as long as it used to, unfortunately. Uh, this is metabolized through 3A4 and 2D6. So if you have drugs that inhibit that, Obviously, 3A4 being the more uh, clinically relevant one that we've been talking about pretty frequently, that that could affect the drug and maybe lead to more, you know, cholinergic side effects if you had a 3A4 inhibitor on board, for instance, right? Or maybe the drug would be less effective if you had an inducer on board, something like phenytoin, for instance. All right, next we have rivastigmine. Uh, you're going to see here that even though it has um, a, a short half-life, interestingly enough, it has a covalent bond that it forms with acetylcholine, which means that it's a dissociation is very slow from the enzyme. It's not completely irreversible, but it does um, have a longer duration of action than just what the half-life would seem like. And so this is why we end up dosing it twice a day. Um, no hepatic interactions we know of, so nice from that standpoint. Um, and again, because of that slow reversibility, it does provide a nice sustained inhibition of the enzyme for you know long term. Uh, so again, one of the benefits of rivastigmine over some of the other ones we'll see here.
and then galantamine. Uh, this one pretty specific um, for acetylcholinesterase. We're going to see that it has a moderate half-life, so it does require twice daily dosing. Again, maybe not the most ideal, but you know, still better than three, four times a day. Um, and you'll see that it will uh, have a similar activity to denepazil, and the fact that it's pretty reversible may lead to it not being as effective over the long term. So one thing to note, and it also is going to be a substrate for 3A4 and 2D6, so you may have some interactions there as well. Okay. So those are the main acetylcholinesterase inhibitors. Just be kind of familiar with... Um, you know, some of the maybe peripheral side effects you may be able to find with these. Why we're using these type of drugs? Like, what's the benefit of inhibiting acetylcholinesterase? Why does that fix or help to uh, resolve some of the issues these patients are having with memory? Uh, you know, and then, um, you know, some of the differences between the drugs, you know, reversibility versus half life, things like that. So that's the cholinergic sort of uh, paradigm of treating par uh, Alzheimer's disease. Now we're going to look at the glutamate neurotoxicity theory. If you recall, we mentioned that glutamate is an excitatory neurotransmitter, and you can find that too much glutamate can be a bad thing because it can cause what we call excitotoxicity. And too much glutamate, meaning you're getting too much stimulation, can eventually degrade and kill off those neurons. So one of the thought being with Alzheimer's is that by having too much glutamate activity, this killing off some of those hippocampal neurons, leading to some of the memory impairment these patients are experiencing. So there could be an idea that maybe by inhibiting uh, glutamate, maybe you could help, help decrease some of the degradation of the neurons, but at least clinically, we don't know if necessarily this will, uh, you know, slow the onset of Alzheimer's, but it may still be able to help out some of the symptoms here. So you may use this for moderate, severe Alzheimer's disease. Here's a drug we have called memantine or Nemenda, and this works by blocking an MDA. So it blocks those glutamate receptors, so it prevents the neurons from being overstimulated by glutamate and hopefully keep them functioning for longer. But certainly we know that it does help improve on cognitive function for these patients and keeps them doing those daily activities like being able to go to the bathroom by themselves and take a shower and things like that uh, for a little bit longer there. Here's an example of what this would look like. <clears throat> Excuse me, it would look like with a presynaptic neuron releasing glutamate, and basically memantine would come in here and block this receptor and preventing a lot of uh, oxidative damage that gets caused by things like calcium uh, that would come through the receptor and leading to eventual cell death. So overall, excitotoxicity is going to be diminished by having memantine around. So um, you're going to see here, again, it has a nice long half-life, so even if the patient forgets a dose, they've been taking it for a while, it won't be really that big of a deal because the levels are going to stay high for long, and it has relatively little drug-drug um, interactions, which is nice. And really well tolerated for the most part, you know, um, headache, dizziness, but nothing other more severe than that. And then again, the question is, is it neuroprotective? We don't really know, but it could be a, a potential thought. Okay, so any questions on that section? As a neuro thing goes on for a really long time. It's odd that I have um, uh, all these really big sections together. So like GI, neuro, and room tend to all be pretty beefy sections. So um, what I'll tell you for the test uh, purposes is that what I don't cover, um, you know, just look at the slide. You should be able to get it. I'll put it on the test. I won't be, I'm just kidding. Um, what we're going to find is uh, that um, whatever I don't cover, I'll just have to push off onto the next test, which is why I still have not made the test yet because I'm not sure where specifically I'm going to be ending at here. Um, so let me cover just like basically the basics of MS uh, and then I'll leave the drug therapy off until next time. I've got about another 12 minutes here, so I think I can at least cover the basics here of MS. Yeah, neuro is a big section, room's a big section, um, and GI is big too, you know, so it's just had a lot of big things all kind of lumped together. Not any other, anyone's fault necessarily, just the way the schedule happened to, to line up. So is what it is, right? Okay, so um, what is, oh, someone actually had a question up here on the board. Uh, so some, so, so the peripheral side effects of the cholinesterase inhibitors is the dumbbells, correct? Yes, absolutely. So, um, you know, we want the central effects to block the cholinesterase, that way we have more acetylcholine to activate the hippocampal neurons. But um, peripherally, if you, if you didn't have a lot of selectivity, or maybe you had like, uh, say you're doing something like denepazil, and you had a CYP34 inhibitor on board, you could potentially see more of those peripheral effects, which include the dumbbells, right? Now, of course, are they going to develop um, bronchorrhea and bronchospasm? Probably not that severe, but, you know, defecation. Could they have some diarrhea? Could they have some incontinence, urinary incontinence? Yeah, potentially. Um, those are the things you'd want to be monitoring for in terms of side effects. All right. So... MS, what is MS? Well, we know it to be another inflammatory disease of the CNS. So this is going to kind of 
uh, kind of bridge a nice um, or have a nice segue into the rheumatology stuff when we get into that later on. But basically, well, I still have a lot of slides to go in this section here. Um, anyway, what we're seeing here is you're having this autoimmune reaction that is affecting the brain and the spinal cord, especially um, the, the cells that are um, utilizing myelin, uh, those myelin sheaths there. And over time, this damage causes these kind of plaques and sclerosed areas, which is why you get multiple sclerosis as the name of the disease state. And so again, um, you don't have to memorize this whole slide here, just showing you the kind of the complexity of the uh, the immune response that's happening here in patients with MS, um, seeing that, you know, basically our immune system is kind of going on, um, uh, you know, kind of overreacting to the body itself. And ultimately what you end up seeing here is it, you have these neurons here that are normally have, have used, utilizing the myelin sheaths. And so over time, you end up having this demyelination that occurs. And if you recall, like what's a myelin sheath really do for us? Well, it allows for really rapid um, transmittance of action potentials down the neuron. Remember those, talking about those nodes of Ranvier where the action potentials can jump across the myelin sheath from point to point, and that really speeds up neuronal transmission. Over time, though, you're going to have degradation of that myelin sheath. And it's going to slow down conduction and overall cause damage to the, the whole nervous system can be affected here. And again, once it's demyelinated, it's really difficult to fix that. And so you can have irreversible damage that happens here, unfortunately. So again, you're stripping the neurons of myelin. Kind of think about like if you ever have uh, made LAN cables or something before you have those wire strippers, kind of like something like that, taking out the, the coating. So um, we're going to find uh, that in terms of treatment, uh, basically a lot of this is going to parallel what we saw with uh, ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. And similar, it will be um, in terms of treatment modalities, we'll see it's very similar to like rheumatoid arthritis we'll get into later on. And so how things will be broken down is going to be into the treatment for the exacerbation. So if they're coming with a flare up, how do we try to shorten the duration of that and try to decrease the severity of the attack they're experiencing? Um, you know, looking at disease modifying therapy, so how do we slow down the degradation over time? So this would be things like your methotrexates, like we saw with UC and Crohn's, um, like, you know, your infliximab and you know, things like that to slow down progression. And then we'll talk about some of the symptomatic therapies, things that can help out with some of the other side effects you're experiencing, uh, quality of life things and, and whatnot. And overall, the main goal is to try to minimize that long-term disability and improve the quality of life. Those are obviously going to be our big things we're going to be shooting for in terms of uh, managing these patients here. So um, not too much time. Do you have any other questions? I know I covered a lot of stuff today. Not as heavy on the jokes, unfortunately. And actually, I just saw a little news news snippet the other day that said one of the um, there's a company looking at a vaccine for MS, which I thought was pretty wild. Uh, so hopefully, something uh, new will come out with that. Um, but I think your guys' brains are probably smoking enough, so instead of a joke, I might just let you go a little early. Um, we'll probably have to push off majority of the room section onto the next test, but don't worry, we will have time to cover everything by the end of this semester. Uh, you know, got nice sixty four hours of lecture time. Uh, so plenty of time to get everything. I think it'll it'll work itself out in the end. Um, any questions before I let you all go? It's okay. Yeah, I'm trying to. A lot of information to get through, but hopefully you guys are kind of assimilating it and can be able to to act on it when you see it on the test. There. Yeah, no problem. Thank you all. Have a great day. Uh, otherwise, I will see you. I guess next week. When do we meet next? Let's see. I mean, Tuesday, and then, yeah, is that it? No, it isn't. Okay, so Tuesday and Wednesday, and then our test will be the next Monday. So, wow, so going so fast already. Now, you guys have a great day, too. See you all next week. Have a great weekend.